often hard to, um, to relate to the kinnis. The language is difficult. It's full of illusions. But I think this year, and we're about to read Kinna Kafkes, so many of the phrases of, these, of this kinna have a, uh, they definitely resonate. Dirosi Chareva, my dwelling is in ruins. So many people have lost their homes, their businesses, their agriculture. Ve'edri Nishba, my flock is captured. We've had some tragedies of capture the last few weeks. The enemy comes up misubchoy from his dense brush, horag hamoinim, zinvom kichvi, he attacked from behind like a snake. Aifo nafshi lahorgim. My spirit is exhausted by the killers. Le misbaharugim, by the number of the murder victims. It carries on and on. Anybody who actually reads Kinnakavches, if you have the English, have a look. So many of the phrases. We are at war. For some reason, they call it Mivtza. I don't know why it's called a Mivtza. It seems a Milchama to me. And the question is, what are we meant to learn being at war? How does it relate to Tisha B'Av? Rabbi Gottlieb mentioned one of the greatest tragedies to happen on Tisha B'Av, and it's one of the five tragedies mentioned in the Mishnah in Tainis, is the fall of Beta. The fall of Beitar was a tragedy, it has to be one of the greatest tragedies in Jewish history. There are accounts of it both in Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi says that Romans killed so many Jews that their horses were up to their noses in Jewish blood. There were two rivers. Each river was two parts water to one part blood. A third was blood. Seven years, the non-Jews fertilized their vineyards with Jewish blood. One estimate of the number of Jews killed is over two million. What led to it? And we have to ask ourselves, what led to it? What can we learn from it to make sure it doesn't happen again? The famous philosopher George Santayana said, the one who does not remember history is bound to live through it again. What can we learn from Beta? The leader of the revolt in Beta, it's known as the Bar Kochba revolt. His name was actually Bar Koziva. And Rabbi Akiva thought that he had the potential to be Mashiach and therefore called him Bar Kochba, thought he was a real star. And he was the one who was holding out against the Romans. And he had an army. And he had an army of 200,000. To get into his army, you had to cut off one of your fingers. That showed you were tough. And he had 200,000 people who'd done this. And the rabbi said to him, how long will you carry on making the Jewish nation blemished. And he said, well, I want to make sure that I have tough soldiers. So they said to him, we'll give you another test. Somebody who's applying to your army has to gallop on a horse, gallop past a cedar tree, a cedar of Lebanon, grab hold of the tree. What will normally happen? The horse will gallop on and the soldier will stay with the tree. But no, to get into your army, you have to gallop on the horse, grab hold of the tree, the cedar tree, and take it with him. If you do that, you get into the army. Talmud Rushami recounts that another 200,000 people passed the second test. So he had an army of 400,000 really tough men. 
And when he went out to fight the Romans, he would turn to God and say, Master of the world, don't help. We don't need you to help. Just don't ruin it. That was his filler. And the Romans besieged Beta for three and a half years, and they couldn't take it. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because in Beta, there was an old man who happened to be Bar Kokhba's uncle. And his name was Rabbi Loza Modoy. And he was fasting, and he was with sackcloth and ashes. And every day he would pray a slightly different prayer. And his prayer would be, Master of the world, please don't sit in judgment today. And after three and a half years, Hadrian is about to give up and leave. And a Kutite comes over and says, don't leave, give me a chance, I can get them for you. And it's somewhat chilling to read this, but he gets into Beitar through a tunnel. He gets into Beitar through a tunnel and goes straight to Rabbi Loza Modoy. And Rabbi Loza Modoy is davening. And when he's davening, he's oblivious to everything that's going on. And the Kutite makes out as though he's whispering in his ear. And people in Beitar see, there's a stranger, what, what's going on here? And they take him to Bar Kokhba. And Bar Kokhba says to him, what were you saying to Rabbi Lezer Madoi? What was he saying to you? He says, if I tell you, the emperor's going to kill me. And if I don't tell you, you're going to kill me. I'm going to tell you. He was telling me that he can get Beitar to come over to the Romans. Bar Kochba goes over to Raul and says, what was he saying to you? What was he saying to you? And Raul Azamadoy says, nothing. What were you saying to him? Nothing. And Bar Kochba doesn't believe him. And Bar Kochba gives him a kick. Can you imagine a Bar Kochba judo kick? And Raul Azamado is an old man, and he's weak after three and a half years of fasting. And he's killed. He dies on the spot. And a heavenly voice comes out and says, You have killed Rabbi Azamadoi. You have killed, yeah, the strong arm of Israel. You have blinded the right eye. Your arm will be killed. Your eye will be blinded. Next words of the, of the Gemara, just the next words, that's all it says. Next words, immediately, Beta was captured and Barco Ziba was killed. And then the Talmud goes into a description of the carnage. What, what are we meant to learn from the story? Firstly, his real name is Bar Koziba. The word kazav, shekev chazav, it's falsehood. His whole approach of, we can do it on our own, that's false. You've got it wrong. He has an army of 200,000. What's the test to get into his army? You have to cut off a finger. The idea, the symbolism that Chazal are telling us is that these soldiers do not have a correct grasp of the situation. They do not have a correct grasp of the situation. Chazal Give an alternative test. 
When you are riding on your horse, and that is the symbol in those days of going out to battle, sus the tank of those days. When you are riding on your horse, when you are in battle, you do have a grasp. You grasp onto the Erez Balvanoin. And what is the Erez Balvanoin? Sadik. Katoma Yifrach. Ke Erez Balvanoin Yiske. You grab onto the Tzadik and you realize that's what I'm taking with me into battle. That's the correct grasp. Rabbi Ozer if you look at his name, Elazar, God helps. We need his help. Mudoi, he's aware. He understands. The Korban Ha'edah, the main commentary on the Yushami, says that when the Baskol proclaims you have killed the Strong arm of Israel, Zroen shall call Israel, Shiosomamidon bitvilosai. The arm is the tfila. And what's the eye? The ain yaminom ki boa toroso hoyu roim or. Rabbeloza Madoi provides two weapons. He provides tfila and he provides Torah. And it's not the 400,000 soldiers. When Rabbi Mudoi is killed, they're still there. But without him, they fail. I was teaching a, a, a group of students from uh, abroad last week, and one of them, the daughter of a Rav that I know in, um, in England, Diane Binstock, she showed me a, an email that her father had received uh, from a young lady who he knows, talking about her brother who serves in Nachal 931. There are 10 young men in, uh, in that regiment, and one of them, Yossi, went to the Sadigo Rebbe before he went out to fight to ask for a bracha. And the Sadigo Rebbe gave him a Noam Eli Melech, say for Noam Eli, small Noam Eli Melech, said, take this with you. In Gaza, he was shot. The bullet went through the left side of his chest, hit the Noam Eli Melech, was deflected, just missing his heart, went through and out the back, missing his spine by millimeters. He was taking the Erez Balvona and with him into Melchama. You know what the most scary part of the story of Beitar is? The part that terrifies me? That the enemy understood it better than our leaders. The Kuti understands I'm going straight to Ravalazam Odoi. Bar Kokhba doesn't get it. You know what I find scary today? More than the tunnels and the rockets, I find it scary that the Hamas understands that Hashem is protecting us and our leaders don't. Maybe you're aware. The Hamas, yes, a number of their leaders have been interviewed. How come your missiles have not been very successful? Their God is protecting them. He's changing their path. We know what we're, we're firing on target. They understand it. That's scary. You know, we understand, you know, we've had all kinds of operations. We've had something called Chom, Chomat Magen. We understand that the only Magen is the Rabboni Shalom, and it's Torah and Tefillah. And when do we acknowledge that Hashem is our shield? Interesting. When we start our Tefillah, when we start our Shemona Esrei, first bracha, Melech, Eze, Moshiach, Umargain, Baruch Atah Hashem, Margain. And when we start Kriya Satora on Shabbos, and the Gabbai calls up, 
the first person, Vyaza Vyagain Vyoshia. It's Torah, it's Tfila. Anybody who thinks it's the 400,000, oh my gosh, that's getting it wrong. We have to understand that, and I read a beautiful article by uh, Elias Stromberg, this, this battle is, is not, it's not just a physical battle, it's being fought on a spiritual plane. All our battles, battles of the Jewish nation, are, are fought on a spiritual plane. And that's why we can make a difference. The first battle that the Jewish nation fights as a nation After Yetzias Mitzrayim, Kriyas Yamsuf is the battle against Amalek. Yoshua takes an army out to fight Amalek. But the Pasuk is absolutely clear. Amalek has nothing to do with the, with, the, with the army. Yes, you need an army. And there has to be his shadows. But we're being told it had nothing. Moses' hands are up, we win. Moses' hands are down, we lose. And Chazal asks in the mission in Rosh Hashanah, like I said, Moses' hands up, we win. Moses' hands down, we lose. The Chiyodov shall Moshe Isis Milchoma, O Shavros Milchoma. Literally, do Moses' hands make or break it? And Chazal answer. It teaches us, Kolzman Shah Yisrael, Mistaklin Klape Mala, O Meshabdin Eslib and Labir Sheba Shamayim, Hoyu Miskabrin, Vim Lab, Hoyu Noflin. By the way, you see again, Yodov Shel Moshe and Mistaklin. We have this dichotomy of Torah Tfila. That is the battle plane of the war against the Monarch, and really it's the battle plane of all our wars. But I want to focus in on one other aspect of the war against Amalek, which I think is so important. Moses' hands are heavy. He can't keep them up. So what happens? They take a stone, and Moshe sits down, and they support his hands. Chazal, in the Gemara in Tainis, asked the question. They couldn't find a pillow? They couldn't find a cushion. He had to sit on a stone. And the answer is that Moshe said, Kivin she Yisrael shruyim betzah, af onu, af ani eye imoyim betzah. If there are Jews who are suffering, I'm going to suffer with them. The last few weeks, there has been a lot of suffering. We have wonderful young men who are going out, literally, Mosa Nefesh. They are suffering, their parents are suffering. There are a whole load of people, not far from Aza, who have to stay within 100 meters of the air raid shelter. There's a lot of suffering. And to, to a great extent, here in Jerusalem, it's quite easy to, to go about your daily life and be totally unaware of what's going on. <coughs> that can't be the approach. The approach has to be the approach of Moshe Rabbeinu. If there are people suffering, I'm going to be suffering with them. There has to be an achdus in Klal Israel. And, you know, each person has to decide, you know, what's appropriate for me to do. I'll give you, you know, I, I was discussing this with some students of mine. Maybe, maybe, you know, we don't, until war is over, until each person has to decide what is over. Maybe I don't have ice cream except on Shabbos. Maybe I don't listen to music. Each person can... Something to show that I am Mishtatev Pitzah. 
something. I don't just carry on like normal. We're together. I feel. The Gemara's in Gittin, when they're talking about the destruction of Yushalayim and Beitar, talk about the destruction of one other major, major settlement. And that settlement was Tur Malka. Tur Malka, huge number of Jews lived there. The Romans were besieging it and they were being defeated by the Jews. A miracle was performed for the Romans, and the Romans say, since, a, since their God has done a miracle for us, we leave. And the Jews start rejoicing, lighting fires, and the Ro Roman emperor looks back and says, they're laughing at us. Uh-huh. And he goes back. And the Gemara says, there were 300,000 sword-bearing soldiers that entered Tuamalka, and they killed three days and three nights. And then, in the most chilling line, the Gemara finishes, on the other side of the mountain, they're still rejoicing. Unaware. Unaware of what's happening. And I think, I don't think it's too far-fetched to suggest that because they were unaware, and because there was that disconnect, that's why the tragedy could happen. I, I, I think we, even though we're in Jerusalem, and, and, and it is so easy to be distant, I think it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to be more aware and feel. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of what can be done. We do not live far from Har Herzl. We do not live far from Har Herzl. You know, I, I think if, if, if we went to one Leviah on Har Herzl and saw the pain, our thrillers would be different. One. I know I went to Max Steinberg's Leviah, 30,000. 30,000 Jews turned up to pay their respects, and he probably didn't know a fraction of 1% of them. And when you see the pain, and when you see the Achtos, and when, it is a totally different experience doubling after that. I know somebody, you know, we have Zechel Churban, we have on our walls Amma al Amma, about 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, unpainted. Because when there's no base amigdash, our homes cannot be complete. I know somebody who, in one of the rooms in his house, taped with white tape a square 60 by 60 on the floor. On the floor. Why? wants to have a little bit of feeling of the pachad of what might come through the floor. Every time he goes into that room, sees the square. That is trying to feel what our brothers and sisters are feeling. I have to share with you, if we're talking about tunnels, one of the Pirkei Tehillim that now has a totally different meaning for me it's perhaps the parak that we say most often, but it's Sora. It's the parak that speaks about Shmira. Esor Einai Hele Horim, Rabbeinu Bechai in Karakemach, says that if you look at that parak, it says Shmira six times. Hashem Shamrecha. Why six times? Four directions from on top and from down below. Wow. From down below. Yeah, I need Shmira from down below. A friend of mine, Jonathan Kaur, showed me a Gemara. Terrifying, terrifying Gemara. It's actually a Gemara in one of the chapters we're allowed to learn, Eile Megalchin, Moed Cotton, Daf Chafei. And there, the Gemara is saying what happened when various sages died. When this sage died, 
there were huge balls of fire that fell down. When Rav Asi died, there was a storm and all the trees were uprooted. Are you ready for the next one? When Rav Ilyashiv died, and it's the only time Rav Ilyashiv is mentioned in Shas. When Rav Ilyashiv died, 70 tunnels were dug in Narada. Cafe Ahmed Base near the bottom. When Rav Ilyashiv died, 70 tunnels were dug in Narada. Evil people could get through. And Rashi says, and in his lifetime, his merit made sure it didn't happen. Terrifying. Erez Balvonoi. Two days ago, two days ago, one of the great tzaddikim of Yerushalayim passed away. A man about whom Rav Yoshev is reported to have said, and my son checked the story with somebody who would know, a, a man about whom Rav Yoshev is reported to have said when he left the room, Rav Yoshev said, there goes a Lamad Vovnik. There goes one of the 36 tzaddikim that keep the world going. Rav Yisrael Bondheim, Zechet Tzaddik B'Kodesh Libracha. Rav Bundheim, just so you have some idea, was once on a bus when a bomb blew up on that bus. Since then he had, you know, he had iron pieces in his back and hearing and, yeah? Carrying him, yeah? He was wounded lying there in his blood. And when they find him, he's already with his pocket Mishnayas, learning Mishnayas, lying there in the blood. And I thought to myself two days ago, we can't afford to lose a man like that now. That's what I thought two days ago. Yesterday, there were two Pigurim in Yerushalayim. Again, I can't say cause and effect. I'm, uh, I'm just giving you a hargosha that I had. Hargosha that I had. On Tisha B'Av, we understand that everything is a spiritual dimension. The spiritual dimension. It's our tshuva, it's our Torah, it's our tefillah. That is what's going to bring the ge'ula. It is not how strong your army it is. It's not what kind of weapons you have. I am sure that I'm not the only person to have had the following feeling. You know, when Naftali and Gilad and Ayal were kidnapped, we know in retrospect that they were killed probably minutes after they were kidnapped within the first half hour. And we were davening with an achdus and a kavona for three weeks. And suddenly I thought, well, you know, actually, in retrospect, what was it all for? Let me tell you, the nisim, and anybody who doesn't see those nisim is blind, the nisim of the last three weeks, we've been drawing, yeah, on the Tfiller account. In those three weeks, we made a lot of deposits. And we, in the last three weeks, have been drawing on that account. I do believe, I do believe that here in Eretz Yisrael, we have been zocher to see, in the tragedy, in the tragedy, we've been zocher to see tremendous Ashkoch Pratis, tremendous nisim. I am sure that not only are there mothers and fathers who are davening down here, but we have our mothers and fathers, others, imos, that are davening for us in Shemaim as well. There are two phrases that have been used nonstop. If you hear people talking about this, uh, this mivza, one phrase is tzuk etan. Chazal tell us, who is etan? Who is etan? Eitan, Gemara and Rosh Hashanah, Yerech Eisonim, Avram Eisonim. Eison is the word used to describe the Ovois. The real Suk Eitan is the fact that we have Ovois who are looking down at us, their beloved children, and davening for us. It's not just our tefillers, but they daven with us. And the other phrase that has been used non-stop is Kippah Bazel. The Arizal, 
This is your site three days ago. The Arizal points out in a number of places in his writings that the Imoz of the Shvotim, Bila, Rochel, Zilpa, and Leah are Bazel. The real Kippah Bazel is the Imoz who are looking down and davening for us. Rochel, Mabaka, Abonel. Hashem Yazor, if we understand that it's, it's the spiritual plane, it's our Torah, it's our Tfila, it's Sufus Ovois, that's where the battle has to be won, then in that merit, we will see the time when Lo Yisa Goel Goy Cherev, Vela Yilu Du Oid Milchoma, Babias Goel Tzedek Bimheru Yomeh. Thank you.